Cronenbourg 1664. Sponsor du Tour de France. approaching the end of their career find different emotions in the Tour de France. Greg Lamond, the three-time winner, suffers the ignominy of finishing in the broom wagon, while Sean Yates at 34 wins the leader's yellow jersey for the first time in a long career. He now leads by a single second over the Italian Gianluca Bortolami and the others are close as well, Johan Museo, Frankie Andreu and Flavio Vanzella. While the streams could never have foreseen what a marvellous Tour de France this would be for Great Britain, we only have two British riders in the race, and now they've both worn the leader's yellow jersey. Last night, Gary Imlach followed the inevitable celebration. A suitably English toast of Sean Yates, domestique, was elevated to head of Motorola's American household last night. And after 13 years of riding for others, even the usually self-effacing Sean had to agree that he deserved it. I mean, I know I've done a lot of work for other guys and Gilbert Duclos-Sal just came in the room and he was really happy for me, so it was great. And I know people think that I deserve some, you know, victories and I've had a few along the way, but for what motivates me, motivates me is to ride for other people and, and that's fine by me. But, and I think that's why the British public like me so much because I, you know, I'm not a superstar, but I always stick it out and I've done over the last 13 years and I think that's what makes me popular. In fact, Sean's win seemed to be popular with everybody. Nice ride, right, mate. Cheers. And after a 32-year wait, who'd ever have expected this? Two British yellow jersey holders in the same photograph, let alone the same race. It's not been so bad, has it? It's, uh, unfortunately, we had the jersey before England and immediately after and not during, which is a bit frustrating for both of us, but I was made up for Sean. This is, uh, he says his last tour. I don't believe it. I wouldn't believe it if I was you. Um, so if that is the case, superb, taking the yellow jersey in your last tour, it's, it's absolutely, it must be a dream for him, I'm made up. And so were the British fans following the race. Yeah, we, we saw him when he did, had his stage win, we thought we might see Borman in yellow again, but to see Sean last night was such a great surprise, All right. absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's a great finish for Sean, isn't it, really, his last tour. C'est pas bon, it's a French stage, c'est pas mal, c'est pas bon pour les... Uh... <laughs> well, as Sean says, there must be 50 ways to lose such a slender lead, especially on another long stage like today. But whatever happens, for travelling fans like the Sydenham Wheelers who are down here at today's start, just seeing Yates in yellow once has made this whole tour worthwhile. Well, thanks, Gary. These really are heady days for the British. The route today runs south from Brittany's capital of Rennes down to Futuroscope, an old favourite with the Tour de France outside of Poitiers. And it's 265 kilometres with three spins along the route and a small hill coming just before the finish. And leaving Rennes this morning, 180 riders and no Greg Lamont, who ironically took the lead here when he won the race in 1989. And the yellow jersey again on a British rider. A proud day for Sean, and he can expect sun all the way with the light tailwinds and temperatures returning to the mid-20 degrees Celsius. Yates' manager is Jim Okovitz. Now the question to him, what about the tactics today, Jim? We've got to keep a close eye on Bartolami, uh, Museo and Abdu Japarov, who are all sprinters. There's three time bonuses today, and there's time bonifications at the finish. We've got to make sure that those riders don't take those bonifications. Abdu Japarov we can give a little bit more space to because he's 30 seconds behind. But Museo and Bartolami are all within four or five seconds. Uh, we've got to keep the race close. So we've got to control the race a little bit during those sprints. And the first sprint coming after only 38 kilometers. It's won by Abdu Japarov, but importantly, Johan Museo has wiped out his four seconds deficit on Yates with a second place bonus. So Yates and Museo are now equal on time. And one rider who has struggled for a few days with his injuries, Didier Roos, was reinstated after being eliminated yesterday. But I can tell you that on the road today, he has given up the Tour de France. 
and the day has been highlighted by a long breakaway by the tallest man in the race, Eros Poli. At one stage he had 18 minutes and but a few moments ago he was swept up by the field as they race towards now the 20 kilometres to go point. It has been a very quick race indeed. The average speed today over 42 kilometres an hour despite the long distance they've covered and Polly did most of the riding himself alone in the front. He's paid the price though, Paul. The race is back together again, and Sean Yates equal on time. Well, he is equal on time at the moment, and it's a very difficult situation because, in fact, the yellow jersey will go to Johan Museo if the race stays as it is at the moment because when two riders are equal on time for the yellow jersey, they actually go back to the time trial and count the one hundredth of a second. And in fact, I just went back and checked. Johan Museo's total time is exactly the same as Sean Yates, but he's on 81 hundredths, and Sean Yates is on 87 hundredths. So therefore, it gives Museo the yellow jersey by six hundredths of a second. Uh, well, this is absolutely incredible. If it stays as it is now, Yates will be out of yellow tonight by six hundredths of a second after a week of racing has gone by in the Tour de France. And that is why we're now seeing the team of Johan Museo, the GBMG team, set the pace here because they know now they've got the man back in the yellow jersey. They held it briefly with Museo when he came to Britain on the stage from Dover to Brighton. Then he passed over to his teammate, Van Zella. And now look at this. This is the important sprint now, the third time bonus sprint of the day at Lenklokler. 230 kilometers to go. And indeed, the Motorola boy is trying to get in on the act here. And in fact, in fourth or fifth place there, there was Sean Yates and having a little bit of problem with Johan Museo there. In fact, the two GB riders going clear. They're going to snap up the points here. Well, the benefits of a strong team as they come for the bonus sprint. But the two boys at the top have had a little discussion. I'm not sure whether it was too pleasant, but they've gone out of the bonus sprint points at the back. No time bonuses for them. So, but to a degree, and there they are. I still saw Sean Yates look to be complaining at the tactics being employed there by the GB team. Well, I saw one or two hands flying free there because that was Wilfred Peters who was next door to Sean Yates as they came over the line. Johan Museo is the man who went across the line in first place to get the six points. But I think there were some dastardly deeds went on as they came up to the last 200 metres there. And I don't think Yates will be a happy man because he's a fair rider and wouldn't like to employ those kind of tactics. Well, Museo was very unhappy yesterday when Sean Yates uh, got the yellow jersey. Now, let's have a look at that again. We can only see the spin finish at the front here. The incident is happening behind, and uh, the team are employing what we think are obstruction tactics, which they're not allowed to do. Museo now is the leader of the Tour de France by six seconds, because that was his bonus on the line. But Sean Yates clearly unhappy with the manner in which the GBMG team have tried to prevent him taking part in that sprint. Now the question is, of course, did anybody from the referees on the race see anything in regular, which is very, very difficult to prove, because obviously there are no referees in amongst the big peloton, and they would have to be standing on the roadside. One would hope they placed one at about 100 metres to go. Well, I think if something did go on there, there's going to be some very angry riders amongst the Motorola yeah. squad. In fact, I could see Lance Armstrong coming to the front almost straight away after the sprint. Phil Anderson launched a little bit of an attack too. So they really will get their uh, their backs up and try and do something about that. Well, Marc Sejon is keeping the pace high now. Again, the Gam boys have come back on the scene. Christophe Capel. They need a little bit of a morale booster now after Chris Boardman gave them the, re the lead for the opening three days. Today they lost Didier Roos. He finally gave up with that painful knee. And uh, yesterday they lost Greg Lamont. So it hasn't been their tour uh, since uh, Chris Boardman lost the lead coming into Calais in the team time trial. There's a little gap beginning to open, and they're, they're saying Museo has been given the first prize and the six seconds bonus to Martinello and Van Zella. So Van Zella also closing the gap now on uh, Sean Yates. He was five seconds down this morning. He's now only three seconds behind Yates. It's quite strange, though, because there's been a little bit of derision there in the team of the GB team because Van Zella was not very happy that the day before when he had the yellow jersey that Museo then had gone for the points to take the gone for the bonus sprint that is to take the yellow jersey off him and it's must be quite a strange feeling in the team at the moment because this is a team that at the end of this season is going to split in half almost and the belgian riders are going to go to one team and the mg riders and the italian riders are going to go to another there's the world champion lance armstrong trying to get into a little move here now 
because this race is far from over it remains a battle of seconds and Lance Armstrong is quite well up in the overall classification to say the least he lies eight just 32 seconds off the lead of Sean Yates this morning he's lost a little bit of ground to Museo he's 38 seconds in fact now behind overall but even so he could wipe that out with a good breakaway towards the end just as Sean Yates did yesterday well, there's still plenty of racing to go. This stage far from decided as the field generally is regrouping. A good time for us to take a short break. Welcome back. You know, there's a saying on the tour, old riders never die, they just get jobs in the media. And this year, two of the best have let go of the handlebars and grabbed the microphone, one of whom you'd expect based on his riding career. The other one, though, he certainly wouldn't. Stephen Roche and Laurent Fignon both know what it's like to win the tour. And now they have something else in common, the hairy legs of the retired racer. Well, like when I'm, when I'm 25, you're better off being a great cyclist than being an ex-cyclist. When you're 35, you're better off being a great ex, great ex cyclist. <laughs> Last year, Stephen Roach said an emotional goodbye to cycling on the Champs Elysees, but he hasn't shed any tears for the sport since then. I think the reason being is possibly because I stopped at the right time. Like I stopped when I wanted to stop, I stopped at the top, and for me that was a very important thing. And I feel now that like I can go to the race, I can talk to the lads, I can come to the start without having any bad feelings whatsoever. Stephen's now lending the benefit of his experience to Eurosport's coverage of the tour. That is, when he's not giving one of his half-dozen daily interviews. It's like kind of as if I was still riding the bike again, except when you're riding the bike, you finish the finish line, and everyone jumps on you, and then you're gone. Like, whereas here in the press room, you can't say, listen, I'm going to massage, or you can't say, listen, I'm going to eat. And you haven't got a better sportif behind you, pulling you along and taking you out of a, out of a hole each time. Of course, Roach was always a media-friendly rider, which is more than can be said for Laurent Fignon. Although now he's working for French radio, he seems to have developed selective amnesia about his old run-ins with the media. Oh, I don't remember. No, no, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> After abandoning his last tour, Lauren doesn't miss the hard work of cycling. In fact, he doesn't seem too keen on work at all. No, I like uh, to do nothing. <laughs> no, I like, uh, like to, do, to play tennis, to, to play golf. And as flowing as he was on the bike, Lauren still has room for improvement in front of the camera. It, uh, it, it uh, won't never... It win, uh, <laughs> but just... just uh, oh. <laughs> Still bateau. Still a bateau. I'm just a lad. Funny man, Mr. Fignon. He's relaxed a lot since he stopped riding. I still wouldn't like to annoy him while he had anything in his hand. All right, that's all from the features department for today. Back to the business end of the tour, out on the road to Futuroscope. Well, thank you, Gary, and you come back to us at the same moment. There's been a crash here where something like 10 miles from the finish and one of the Ante riders on the floor, and that is Roberto Sierra from Spain, and he looks the worst injured. It was a touch of wheels. Dr. Gerard Port is with him. We'll be concerned about the fact he's got a bit of a headache there before they let him go again up towards the finish. And one or two other riders down there also have a problem. Back wheel change and back in the race. And that looks like Gianni Bunyo, is it? Well, that yes, is it Bunyo, is. Who had Gianni a problem Bunyo. at the back of the field. And there's a place where he shouldn't have been because the crash was at the back of the field, definitely. This is what happens when the wind is coming from the, the, the left or the right hand side. The riders are fighting to keep in the shelter of the wind, a touch of wheels, and it goes down. Now it'd be nice to be able to get back down there. I think we're looking at the rear of the field here, seeing the riders who've been dropped off and been separated because of that crash. And I'm just wondering if any of the big spinners were caught back there too. One of the spinners, by the way, who didn't ride today, uh, Fontanelli, he was another victim of that crash right out on day one at Armentier. Uh, he couldn't start this morning. He had a fever, so he's retired from the tour as well. And it looks as like we have Yekimov again launching an attack on the right, taking his chance. I've seen him win a stage of the tour going in the last kilometre. The last four kilometres it was indeed, or last time he won, because we said at the time, he was a man who was world champion over 4,000 metres on the track and he went to 4,000 metres, and he's gone at about 3,600 this time. I tell you what, and he's really got the gap straight away, and there's no organised chase from the sprinters behind, and if they don't start reacting straight away, this man is going to go away to the stage of victory. Look at the risks he takes going around that corner, a good line, but he hardly lost any speed at all, and he 
gets back out of the saddle to take himself back up to 50 55 kilometers an hour this is the kind of man who came from the same school as Chris Boardman in fact he was the world hour record holder himself he's been world record holder world points champion he's won the Olympic title he's had 11 world records current at one stage he is so fast when he's alone and if they let him go they won't see him until he's showering down at the finish this is a five piece of riding by Vyacheslav Yekimov as Paul said earlier he has had his best win of the season this year in the Tour du Pont in the United States but he also has finished third overall in the Paris Nice stage race the race they call the race to the sun and won the Tour of Valencia as well so this could be a superb ride for him his only stage win in the Tour de France coming back in 1991 and just look at the speed he goes now Paul he just is holding the line as tight as he can as we're really not far away now from entering Futuroscope. There's about two kilometers to go. They really are chasing to catch him, but there are not very many men in the field today who could get across to him at this speed. One of them is obviously Chris Borman and maybe Miguel Indirain himself if he was thinking about the stage victory. But look at the way he goes around the corner. He cuts the road, cuts each corner to try and get a good line around the corner. He has a look over his shoulder to see how much of a gap he's got, trying to dose his effort to make sure he gets every last little bit of energy out just before the line. Well, on a day when Word Perfect lost one of their best riders, Franz Masten, he retired today for the first time in seven Tours de France, unwell. They're now going to celebrate a stage win, I think, because no way is that field going to cross this gap now. We're now seeing the man who was once the star of the Soviet Union, who could ride the track so quickly, everybody just watched and couldn't believe it. And now he's turned that speed onto the road as a professional rider. This is exactly the way he won his stage a couple of years ago. He went at the same point. He had a couple of dummies out there today when he went and was caught, but this one was for real. A massive, long, thin line of riders, and I don't think they're going to reach him. It's going to be very close. It's five seconds at the moment, and I think the roundabouts on the run into the finish line here are going to help him because he'll be able to negotiate them quite easily on his own, and the main field behind won't be able to organize a chase. He's flying along here. Look, he checks over his shoulder, but the main field are just there now. It's just about 100 meters behind him. So Yekimov goes alone, and he, I think he's going to make it because he's just over a kilometer to go. We're into the confines now of Futuroscope. There is the kilometer kite, and Yekimov is clear of the field. This is a tremendous ride by this man. The sort of stage that he would do this on. He's waited for the chance to do it. He put in a stunning time trial when he won the Tour Dupont. I was on that race, and what a great time trial he did then. And he's kept the form. But they're right on him. They're on him inside of the finish. Now it's an uphill finish, and I can't believe it, but it, this is uphill. And I don't think he'll be able to do it because he... And there's the hill, and there he goes. Yekimov beaten by the uphill gradient of the sprinters line up for the finish now. Well, can you believe that as they swing into the home straight? Yekimov swept out of it. They came at him so quickly. Jan Zarada is digging deep now to have a go for the line, but it's the Palti team who are now trying to finish this off as they come up towards the finishing line now. And uh, in fact, Shimon Abdul Jabrov diving everywhere, but Jan Zarada and Olaf Ludwig on the left of our picture. Now Martinelli in the centre gets washed away, and it could be Ludwig on the line. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was Jan Zarada who took it on the line. And that's his stage win, a superb finish by the man who once finished third overall in a milk race in Great Britain. Now Jan Zarada has got his stage win in the Tour de France. And again, I think the photograph will confirm it. But Olaf Ludwig has finished second for what is now the fourth time in the stage of the Tour de France. There's the finish of the sprinters, Abdu Japarovs, the rider at the bottom of our screen. And as they come up to the line, it was Minali who got swept away, the, the winner in England, and Zarada takes it. I think, in fact, Abdu Japarov gets second, and Olaf Ludwig will be third. Once more, from this angle of the camera, it was the hill that beat Abdu Japarov. We thought he would favour Ludwig, but in fact, Jan Zarada, the former Czechoslovak, and now a Slovak, who wins on the line. And indeed, in this angle, Abdu Japarov is second, and Olaf Ludwig is third. 
three stage wins in the Tour of Italy. Now he gets his first in the Tour de France. Jan Zorada winning today ahead of Abdu Japarov and Olaf Ludwig. And the winner in Portsmouth, Nicola Manali, gets fourth. But the man who lost time on a comparatively easy day, Gianni Bugno, involved in that late crash. On the podium, Zorada, all smiles. He's mixed it every day with the best sprinters. Now he gets his just desserts. There is a change overall in the general classification. Johan Museo now leads Sean Yates by six seconds. Gianluca Bortolami is third at seven seconds. Flavio Van Zella is fourth, ten seconds back. So that final sprint out on the open road near the finish gave the yellow jersey back to Johan Museo. He'll have to defend that tomorrow. And now with Paul Sherwin, the deposed leader of the Tour de France, Sean Yates. Sean, it looks as if there's a little bit of argy-bargy went on there as you uh, came on up to the last hotspot sprint point. Yeah, Musset, I mean, uh, Johnson didn't want me to take Musset's wheel, so he pushed me off. So we had a bit of a fight, you know, but that's what it's like when you're sprinting. Do you think you had a chance to take it back there? Because you looked very strong at the time. I know that it was very close between you and Musset. Musset is a much faster sprinter than me, so, you know... It was an uphill battle, but for me it's not a problem. He's here, one of the most, one of the drivers I respect the most in the peloton, so it's good for him to take it back. I tell you, Sean, finally, it must have been a great day for you. How did you feel riding along with the yellow jersey? Yeah, it was good. Everyone made way for me, <laughs> you know, and uh, at least I've had done it once in my life. It's good. Well, it's every rider's ambition in the Tour de France to wear the leader's maillot jaune at least once, and now Sean Yates can say he's done that. And you know, tomorrow he could even regain it the way this Tour de France is going. He's now in second place, just six seconds off the lead. And talking of tomorrow, it's competition day. We'd like you to try and select the winner of the stage in Poitiers down to Trellisac. And judging by today's weather, it's going to be a long, hot ride. And it could well be a day for the sprinters. But don't forget, that finish today by Yekimov. I'm sure he'll go again tomorrow. When you think you have the answer, you can phone until midday tomorrow with your selection. The number is 0891 44 Double four, double four. The prize will be the Mayo Jean of the leader of the tour tomorrow night, signed by him, a copy of the signing on sheet, and also a copy of Chris Borman's new book, The Fastest Man on Two Wheels. And we'll also give two runner-up prizes tomorrow, also a copy of Chris's book. It's been a great day of racing today, but bad luck for Gianni Bugno. He lost a lot of time in those closing miles, and he may well have lost the tour because of it. Until tomorrow night, at our new time, don't forget tomorrow, five minutes to six, Goodbye.